No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Today, I have my good friend and a guy with a very, very interesting story to tell, Ryan Mills, on the podcast. Hello. So the the story that we're going to tell, in short, today is about Ryan Mills, young, professional BMX rider coming up in the world, who then, at a certain point, gets into some bad stuff, and then basically uh, manages to weave his way past that bad stuff and end up where you are today, where you're a happy, healthy individual here to tell the tale. Yeah. Basically. Shockingly. So where are you from a little bit? And let's talk about just you getting into bike riding in the first place. Okay. Um, I'm from a little town called Boulder City, which is right outside of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of like where my BMX journey began. And, uh, you know, just normal little kid shit riding around just for fun like after school and just started doing it all the time were you talented from a young age did you feel like people were looking at you like you had a lot of potential uh i feel like i picked it up pretty quick um got a hold of like a camera and did like the normal sponsor me video type of deal for like just on my own so you were sponsored at a young age uh yeah well i mean I, we had an inner bike in las vegas so right. like very I good would, place like, to get sponsored yeah, yeah so i would just take the tapes there and just hand them to people and like got a with GAC BMX was like one of the first ones. GAC, wow, yeah. it's been a while, yeah. Yeah, and they were like flowing me stuff. I think I was 16, probably, okay. then. Yeah, so it started picking up then. And then uh, started like, uh, there was like a time in Vegas where like the airport bought out all the all these houses for like more of, to expand. Okay. And there was just like a ton of pools. And we were riding all these pools all the time. And then, like, a dude from Dig BMX came through. And that's how I got, like, my first photo in a magazine. It was, okay. like, he just, like, shot a pool carve. Right. And I think I was, like, 17 then. So it's, like, from high school and then, like, into college. It started, like, just picking up a lot. And did you have it in your head that you were going to be a pro rider? Or did you think that you were going to make, like, a good living from riding? Or what, in, did you know any pros? Like, what was your idea of what it, this whole journey you were on was going to be like? Um... I don't I I I don't know that's a hard one to It wasn't like a it, it was like obviously like a dream like to do that but it wasn't like in you know my cards. Like, it's not like you were so aware of what this was going to be like that you like had a vision. Yeah, of, I was just like having fun with it and then like starting to get noticed more and more and then like just meeting people and started going to contests and stuff and like meeting more people, meeting Walter Perringer. He asked me to be in the mutiny video mm. without like being on mutiny. So it was kind of weird. Wow. But so like all this stuff kind of happened and people just come through Vegas all the time to ride. So like people started hooking me up and then I got a cover on BMX plus the same time the mutiny video came out and then like a bunch of people started calling. Nice. Yeah. Okay. W- was getting fucked up part of your youthful existence at this point because uh, from my memories of being a young bmx rider it was like very very cool to be straight edge for a long time and then maybe at some point in there like especially as the people that i was around started to get older then it was kind of became more of a oh cool let's go get drunk thing yeah uh yeah it was it was cool to be straight edge for sure i remember that period um but like i i had like knee problems when i was 16 like pretty quick and it was like every time I'd pedal, it would be like painful. So mm. I'd start going to pain doctors and uh, getting prescriptions. I didn't like realize it was like going into drugs. So like that kind of like introduction to it was like just like a slow, steady, like I'm doing this and not not realizing I'm getting fucked up. And then like around like 18 or so, I was like started like getting drunk all the time and like going to parties and like doing like, oh, I'm a BMXer go party deal so you were getting what like vicodins from the yeah the doctor yeah so okay yeah, with Vicod- or percocets or something when you were like 16 but so you were taking them to what just be able to ride yeah yeah so i'd be at first it was like obviously like by the script but even less than that and uh at you know for a few years it's just like you know i wasn't running out of pills but eventually i started running out of pills early i'm just like taking them all the time right and then at some point i I just like took a couple and like felt that opioid rush type of thing and I was just like, Oh shit, this feels fucking great. Right. And then from from that point I was probably like I think I it was it wasn't long like after I remember the Columbine shooting. 
or maybe it was like yeah something like that columbine shit i think i was in eighth ninth grade yeah. with 99 yeah and uh that yeah i remember like seeing that on the news and like feeling that high at the same time and so it was like from then on i was like always like trying to get pills everywhere like find more doctors to get more prescriptions and so forth and had it really occurred to you that the doctors were basically giving you pills that were you know turning you into a drug addict or, or in did, your mind yeah. was it still like oh I'm, I'm just doing what the doctor gave me so yeah. there's nothing in, wrong with this in so. my mind it's like this is fine it's like totally legal stuff it's like everyone uses them like this is their solution to my pain so mm. this is the only solution they gave me so right that's what i'm gonna take and it's pretty crazy to think about it now that the doctors who are giving you that shit that they weren't explaining to you in any way the risk right i would right. assume no yeah i mean I, like on the pill bottles like these can be addictive but right. it's like i never thought i had a problem i was like actually talking today about it um realizing the point of the first withdrawal that i felt was i was like 21 living in portland and i woke up one day and i was just like felt like i had the flu and i was just like oh man i feel fucked up right and i popped a pill and like 15 minutes later that whole feeling went away and i was like oh this is withdrawing like this is what that feels like i didn't because the whole time i was just like oh I, I don't get withdrawal i'm not addicted so so you went all those years without running out because yeah. they were pretty easy yeah. to come by and you had different doctors yeah. who were really writing your prescriptions and stuff yeah and it was a pretty low like do like dose going through it like like taking it responsibly type of thing right and then once i was living in portland it was just like a party every day i had a apartment with like eddie cleveland and a bunch of like you know ben hucky all those like dudes were there and we're all partying all together every single day right uh and just like living together right and that's when i realized i was like oh i need these pills and it's like it was kind of and what was it like drinking on top of also being on the pills like how did that change the whole thing uh uh, I could handle a lot of shit, so it was like, because I was on it for so long, I didn't really correlate it. Right. But I was like, obviously mixing the whole time, and it's like infinitely easier to get blackout drunk. Oh yeah, there was yeah. I mean, I was I was probably drunk, stoned, and on pills the entire time in Portland. Right. Like, and then just downfall from there. But it it felt like your BMX like your BMX career was all coming together throughout all of right, this. So yeah. like you were riding at like a fairly high level despite being fucked up. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I filmed the entire premium products video pretty much in Portland that entire time. I was just I remember seeing clips. I filmed with Shad one day. I remember seeing the clips a couple weeks later. Uh -huh. all, all like I was zannied out filming the clips mm. and I like 180 over a dumpster and like some shit. I was just like, wait. I do not remember that really but yeah so it was pretty intense and had like a couple little like close overdoses and shit like up there wow so, yeah do you think that it was kind of did it make you fearless that you were all fucked up and that you couldn't really comprehend the risk or po yeah possibly yeah, yeah. make me like hug myself more than i would have or at the same not. time i feel like it would be so hard to like ride well when you're all fucked up on pills because it's just got to be hard to be coordinated or to right. feel strong and shit well once you're like on it for that long right. like you funk you're functioning and like when you don't have it you're not functioning so you're you're feeling like just like your equilibrium's off when you're riding and like so i would have to take pills to like be able to go ride a skate park or like i like i look back i got a old bmx magazine i did an interview in and I was just like shocked at the shit I was saying in it. Just like, really? like explain a day, start the day, take two pills. You so said like, it yeah. in the magazine? Yeah, just like, yeah. And this is before you had acknowledged that you had an issue or whatever? Yeah, yeah. What, what was this printed in? Who was allowing uh, this to be printed? I think it, it was Ride UK. Really? Yeah. And they were just acting like it was like a funny. I mean, I don't know. They, I mean, I didn't like do it in person. So it was just like an email interview. Okay. And I just like, that was my answer. It's like, wow. to take them, you know? That's crazy. Yeah. Holy so. shit. Um, but okay, so how f for the people out there, how would you explain like how your BMX career went? Like, would you, you would you say you ever reached the point where you were like feeling like a comfortable, well paid professional? Uh, no. Well, no, I mean, yeah, I was always struggling. It was like I think maybe some BMX companies were kind of wise to like me being fucked up all the time, really? and like maybe that held them back from wanting to give me a paycheck or mm -hmm. something. But yeah, I never like was like in a comfortable position. I was always struggling. Uh, 
like getting helped out by my parents like for rent and stuff like while I was in college. The BMX a dream right there. Yeah. It was just like yeah, just not eating and it was just like, you know, kinda hell. It's kinda I mean, BMXers really don't get paid that much now anyway, but like at at my like my uh probably my peak for like money wise, it was I had a deal with Monster. It was like twelve thousand a year. Oh really? Yeah, and then that was pretty much it. Like photo, photo contingencies and whatever else, like added a little bit to it. But right. Yeah. Would you say that through being fucked up, did you ever start to like lose your love of BMX throughout those years, or lose touch of why you were riding or or what this was all about for you? Yeah, I I, I remember a moment thinking. What, what the fuck am I even doing? Like, what, I'm just like little kid bike tricks. Like, this is like, I need to grow out of this type of thing. Mm-hmm. And like, just like not understanding the fun part of it anymore. And it was like, a, always like a business struggle. Like, I'm not getting paid. This is fucked up. Like, I'm like killing myself and like, just not getting anything for it. Like, what's the fucking point anymore? And I remember just like, f- like kind of fading away. And as the drugs, were more on my mind to like, I need to get drugs was like the main concern of the day. Mm. And, so, and the BMX just kind of fell off pretty quickly. Damn. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. When did it start to get really bad? Like when did th- your life kind of start to fall apart as a result? Cause it, it feels like you did a pretty good job of holding everything together for, for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I, I graduated college, broke up with my girlfriend, uh, and, quit riding all in like the same couple months. Uh-huh. And so like everything, everything just kind of became like a drug thing. And I was like hustling pills, hustling, like learning like the stealing game of shoplifting and uh, like kind of like getting in trouble every once in a while with the law. So, so that transformation where you kind of realize at a certain point, like, oh, I'm going to need more money than I could possibly make through anything legal. So I'm going to have to start yeah. stealing and shit. What was like yeah. the introduction to that like? Well, well, it, well, like the habit was to a point with the pills before I like started doing heroin was it was like getting to like 120, 150, 180 dollars a day. Jeez. And so like a pill is ten dollars, anywhere ten to fifteen dollars. I'm doing like almost twenty pills a day, and I'm not. And people are just like, oh, dude, just do heroin. Just do heroin. It's fucking cheaper because these are like the people I'm hanging out with now. I and mean, you you were trying to hold off on. Yeah. going into yeah, that because you kind of like, know yeah, that this is like, where this is heroin there's like, no coming back for this right. i could take 15 pills a day but at least i'm not doing heroin right and then you know obviously you remember i remember taking the first heroin ever and i was like this is exactly like pills yeah so but like the the stealing introduction was just like out of necessity um but i ended up meeting like this like graffiti artist slash like racker like stealer shoplifter like kind of god shout out to all the taggers right he was a god <laughs> yeah, so he, he was, was like, like really a, official a, with this yeah shit? he was official but he wasn't a drug addict he was just he, really no, he into was graffiti? a drug addict oh, he did? Okay. mainly meth but like he's he started doing a little heroin with me and i started doing a little meth with him and mixing like that oh, that's but sweet. We, i had a car and he would just be on my couch all the time getting like fucked up and then we he would like take me under his wing and like show me the ropes and then i ended up becoming extremely <laughs> good at the shoplifting what was like the the central crop that you were going out there and Uh, taking from its owners in the beginning it was like jeans like go get like 20 pairs of jeans and that will get you like 400 dollars in drugs and how would you sell them you would return straight to the drug dealers oh yeah and you sell the jeans to them yeah wow yeah just trade straight for drugs so it's like you get a a hundred dollar pair of levi's and it turns into twenty dollars of heroin Basically. Right. So it probably seems like a pretty good deal for right. you in that position. Oh yeah, you yeah. just walk into a store, take a stack of ten or twenty jeans, and you walk out and you have like a ton of money. <laughs> that was your yeah way of doing it though. It was yeah. nothing more slick than that. Um, you just pick it up was, and walk out. There were uh, different creative ways, but like at times it would just go in, pick it up, walk out. Mm-hmm. But also there was like times where you just go into the dressing room, put ten pairs on, mm-hmm. put a fucking couple of hoodies on, and you just look like a fat dude walking out of the fucking store that's an underrated uh way of doing it i was watching some graffiti video the other day and the guy just walks into fucking home depot fills up the whole cart with spray paint and then just yeah, walks just the walks fuck out. out my girl's watching it with me and she's just like having a hard time wrapping her head around how this is possible and i'm like i mean think about it nobody's looking at him like no right. like it's like, if you're that bold yeah you know that goes a long way i mean i was doing that with groceries for the same people like and you know uh 
going in getting like nice steaks whole cart full walking out and that's a ton of money wow like, yeah and it's quick so at this point you had completely left bmx behind i'm guessing yeah that was, it was didn't even touch bike think about a bike look at anything to do with bikes and that was like for you know for five or six years of just like completely being out of it wow yeah so you get really into the stealing yeah and how does that sort of transform i'm assuming you didn't just stick with stealing the same thing well, over I, and over yeah i mean you get higher end stuff like nice fifteen thousand dollar bags and finding you stole fifteen thousand dollar bags how the fuck yeah. are you stealing those well <laughs> just like you know gotta get creative i walk into the store like a lot of them would be locked down and want some's on the mannequin and just chilling swoop it real quick be real smooth have a backpack on flip the backpack up throw the bag underneath it backpack slams your back you walk out the store but a fifteen thousand dollar bag is like you're talking about like the high-end stores in yeah, the mall yeah. so there's gonna be like a lot of security oh, there's eyes on it for sure but yeah you just like if you're slick you know where cameras are like you study every fucking aspect of what's going on where when the security there what security is there like i had a whole map of the of vegas like the strip was just like a playground for me so it was an average day like you wake up and you get fucked up and then you go steal a bunch of shit so that you can get more fucked up or is it kind of like you wake up you have nothing so you have to go out and steal in order to get fucked up that night it's a it's a little of both uh if the obviously like you're when you wake up and you have nothing like which would happen sometimes or like someone would rob you in your sleep and shit like that you wake up and have nothing you're in panic mode in desperation mode and that's when you kind of get caught up hmm. like i would get i went to jail 14 times like basically for shoplifting but in like a eight year span right yeah you know, so it's like pretty every day of doing that that's so not bad that is pretty good actually <laughs> yeah. that's pretty astounding <laughs> yeah. did you ever get in serious trouble for shoplifting or not really it, yeah it started like towards the end it started getting worse and worse like the penalties and like there's like he's not gonna stop so we're gonna give him more time more time right and as then, cops at a certain point it's like well what yeah. the fuck are we gonna do if this yeah. guy's just gonna keep yeah. doing this my for the rest of our lives my neighborhood where i was like you kind of like stay around the same neighborhood because that's where you know where to sell shit and the people you know the drug addicts you know right that neighborhood the every cop knew my name every, like and they would just like run up on me at times and right just like, yeah because i'm trying to picture you being at the mall being like a super bad drug addict and just like sort of lurking around the gucci yeah. store and it's kind of hard for me to imagine you not just standing out a lot at a certain point yeah uh so at points yeah like those desperate times but like for the most part you're you can go play the part because you're you can get any of that shit yourself so i'm wearing Gucci shit and I'm wearing I'm walking in there and I'm like clean it up and walk in there and just you know get whatever right yeah did you ever have any like crazy fucking heists like anything like that really that you took it to another level uh we did uh yeah what well, we started going out with like crews kind of and it would be a little better we'd have like kind of like our own security <laughs> people like the knockout man at the so door. if somebody tried to stop so you they would stop just you, fuck them they up they stop them yeah and we would do like go in and like true religion say uh -huh. and everyone goes in and fucking grabs and runs out like and they had stacks like just on tables right and that's like three hundred dollars a pair wow so and so you would just how do you form a crew in that sense like the, the like it, it seems like you know they, they say there's no honor amongst thieves it feels like it would be kind of hard to like bring people together for that goal right well it just kind of like organically happens but for the most part, like, I guess our crew, there was, like, a little bit of honor amongst us, and we always, like, would help each other out when, like, in need for, like, drugs and shit. Uh -huh. But also, at the same time, they're the same people robbing you and, like, looking, helping you look for your drugs, mm. you know? So it's, like, you can trust them for the most part, like, when it comes to, like, us against the the law but like when it's us against us it's like i don't fucking but you talk it. about people stealing from you in your sleep as if that was just this like painfully uh, normal so occurrence much, yeah all the time yeah because really? you, you, you're not out doing heroin you're mm. fucking out they just fucking rummage your pockets to like just look through your bags and just take whatever right and so was it always opiates and heroin for you or, or when did it start to transform into other stuff yeah it was it was for the most part uh, well, the pill, like the pills, got to be too much. So I just like quit. I was like getting prescriptions still, but like selling them to get heroin. Because at a certain point, that stuff just becomes useless. Yeah, and then like 
you kind of like start shooting the heroin because everyone's telling you, oh, you save money and you can make it last longer. So you get to a point where you're just shooting all day. So shooting is the ultimate in comparison to like smoking it. Because I was talking to somebody the other day who was talking about smoking heroin and saying that that was, oh no, I was talking to Big Head and he was talking about smoking heroin or other drugs because then you can do it you can moderate it more yeah. instead of like if you pop a fentanyl pill right. then you're you might die but you're, if you yeah if definitely you do it little by little you're less likely to you're die you're less likely to die if you're smoking like you're not going to get to the point where you're going to overdose smoking just regular heroin if there's fentanyl in there yeah you could but like just regular heroin you're going to pass out before you get to the point where you're overdosing but right. you're just shooting you just sometimes the heroin's stronger and you just you know fucking you're out but shooting it up gives you that fucking shooting, crazy moment you, where you yeah. just really get fucking plastered super fast yeah and then like you're i was like mixing it with coke too so it was just like stay awake and feel it wow and like, it's just like this euphoria high thing that was like very attractive at the time and uh but i got to a point where i had lit like abscesses all over my entire arms my veins were all collapsing and i was shooting and missing and not getting that high for like you know, years. So you could fuck up, and if you miss the vein, you, you just shot the heroin into like your into your muscles, and then and if it if any little infection on your or like dirt in your arm goes in there, you get an infection, and like you're not you're not obviously thinking about cleanliness when you're shooting heroin, right? Like, and uh, so yeah, your veins end up collapsing, and you, if you have coke in there, you can't even feel if you're missing because it numbs you, right? And uh, I don't know, it's pretty intense, but I ended up quitting shooting up, and once dabbing came around for weed, or dabs or whatever. Whack, so you started doing I started dabs? dabbing heroin. Oh, dabbing heroin. Yeah, okay. I yeah. started dabbing heroin and dabbing weed. How was like, dabbing heroin, though? Was it, it, it was like a lifesaver for me. It probably saved my arms because my arms were like twice as thick as they should have been, just infected with all the shit, no veins to shoot into. Right. And... Uh, I was just smoking it and getting extremely high from the dab because it's just a bong load of fucking heroin smoke. Right. Yeah. So. Holy shit. Yeah. I, I mean, at one point I thought my arms were going to be amputated. I never went to the doctor because it's like, you know, you go to a doctor or a hospital like that, they're going to be like, okay, I'm calling the cops. They call the cops on you because you're so obviously a crazy heroin addict? Right. I mean, that's the that's what I was thinking. But they you can't know. lock you up for just being a junkie, right? No. Nah. Not not anymore. I mean, I think they used to like, kind of do that more often, mm. yeah, but things laws have changed and shit's been changing over the years. And was was fentanyl not really on the scene during not, your time in the sun? Not really. I mean, I can recall a few times in Portland when I first heard about it, like a cancer patient had it, sold us some patches. We cut the patches and then put the liquid under our tongues and just be fucked up for like two days. Really? Yeah. It's it's so intense and it's so scary. Like that that's the new thing on the scene. And right. Everybody wants it. It's so cheap and so much more powerful. Like everybody wants it, but everybody's dying. Because when you yeah, like because you're you're involved now with like people who are in recovery and everything. Do you see you know nine people who are fucked up off fentanyl for every person who's just doing straight heroin? Isn't it like super hard to get heroin at this point? Yeah, I mean he, like, fentanyl is literally in every drug now. It's like in meth. It's in weed. It's in like just because that addiction of like the you start. You need to come back to that drug dealer to get that drug. So that's so a it. guy who's selling weed will sprinkle fentanyl in his weed to to, to get to you to come it. back. Yeah, yeah. And so you're telling me that if I fill a blunt with weed that has this fentanyl stuff, that that's gonna get me extra fucked up, and yeah, that then I'll be craving it. Potentially get you addicted over time. Yeah, like over. It can, wow. Yeah. It, it doesn't take long for you to like have that craving and like to start feeling withdrawal and stuff. Do you think anybody's ever like started a Chinese food restaurant and just start putting fentanyl on the orange chicken That's and just be like, motherfuckers are gonna keep coming back for this? Possibility. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure everything has been done. So. People say that all the time, like, oh, I swear that fucking ramen noodles that had crack in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's what, probably like, not true. But like, what I do with like work now is, is main like. It's called overdose data to action. So, like, I, I see all the data for all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, like, the fentanyl right now during COVID has gone up. Like, I think it was, like, 225% Wow. the use in Nevada. So, yeah, it's uh, definitely the main drug on the scene right now. But, like, when you hear about somebody, you know, taking a fucking Percocet that really just had mad fentanyl in it or whatever, 
doesn't it kind of like go against the aims of the drug dealer? Because if you are selling fake pills, wouldn't you still not want the people taking them to die? Yeah, ideally you'd want them to. You'd want them to yeah, live and continue to right. buy from you. So like, how how do they end? Up, is it just because like the process by which they're making the bad drugs is like fucked up? So there there just might be too much in one one yeah. of the pills and not much at all in one of the other pills. Or? Yeah, it's just like at home. P- pill press shit and right. like no one knows it's not like regulated it's like just super scary but yeah i mean you ideally you want your customers to come back but right. it's such a huge problem there's always going to be more customers it's like mm. like that guy died there's five more people that replace him like right yeah so at a certain point but by the time you get really into this where's your family at where what happened to all your bmx friends by this point did you feel like everybody just sort of wrote you off and just forgot about you or what was that like um i'm i'm sure there's a little bit of that uh but for the most part i i separated myself from my family and my friends obviously I like stuck around with my family longer because they were would kind of like help me out sometimes with money mm-hmm. I didn't. I couldn't like ask friends for money. Like it's all BMXers. No one has money. So and I'm not gonna go rob my BMX friends. These are like family to me. Uh-huh. So I just kind of slowly fade away. A few of my bike rider friends were doing drugs with me, and we kind of just closed ourselves off. And then more new people came in, and those BMXer friends would go away. And then I was just surrounded by all drug addicts. Right. Yeah. It's crazy because. I was someone who only knew of you as like a guy in videos and magazines. Yeah. And yeah, it was like a conversation that we would kind of frequently have because we didn't really have like the actual knowledge about what happened to you. We had just sort of heard, oh, that guy's fucked up on pills. And so we wouldn't, you know, it would just be that conversation like, what the fuck happened to that Ryan Mills guy? Oh, I heard he's all fucked up on pills now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, we would have that conversation, but it wasn't like the, the media wasn't really like, covering it it wasn't like now with social media where if there was somebody who was in a bad place like that then i feel like it, you know the people on instagram would end up kind of having that conversation about him it would be a bit more evidence of like oh that's what that guy looks like now so maybe he's not doing so good you know it being like the early 2000s there wasn't a lot of that it was more like yeah. just word of mouth like ryan Mills ain't doing too good i remember uh somebody like googled me because like they heard that I rode BMX or whatever that I was hanging out with. I think I didn't even have a phone at this point, but like they popped up, they put my my name with BMX and an old BMX board forum came up and it was about me disappearing. Oh, and I think I, I remember just, that. Yeah. yeah. I was just like, uh, this is insane. I was like, I had no idea. And I just kind of shut it off and didn't think about it again. But right. I remember seeing comments of like, oh yeah, he, he lives under a bridge. Like he lives in a cardboard box now and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, damn, that's great. How did people, people even know this shit because like i was right. homeless and i was fucking doing drugs and just like wasted when did you actually become homeless though uh that was like mm, i would say around 2012 i lost my apartment and i start and but th- at that time there was like the real estate you know crash so there was tons of foreclosed houses everywhere. Mm. So I wasn't like homeless to the fact where I'm on the street, but I was like just hopping house to house. You didn't own the homes that didn't you were staying. Yeah, <laughs> but I was just like going into like homes with no power and just inhabiting until like I kicked out basically. Right. So I mean, maybe like once or twice I actually slept on the street. I remember sleeping in a closet a couple of times, like in an alleyway. But yeah, it was a different kind of homelessness, I guess. It was Damn. like a survival. So at that point, though, had like your ability to, you know, go out and do these stealing missions or that kind of did that ever go away at a certain point because you're so fucked up that you kind of couldn't really keep it together enough to even pull this shit off? Um, well, yeah, uh, it, it, and it's also extremely tiring to do. Mm. And uh, I had I ended up at one point renting an office probably like 2000. 15 for like 200 dollars a month that i was living in i just told him it was my art studio and so i just lived in there and i started like selling heroin and met this girl through selling heroin that was like basically a high-end prostitute and i ended up and she had like a giant house on a golf course and i ended up just going over there all the time and then ended up hooking up with her and then we ended up dating and so i like lived in this mansion like the last part of my addiction right but like she was just out getting money from like this really uh, 
extremely rich dude. That so she would go out and, and get money all day so that she could then do drugs with you? Yeah. But that actually like, sounds like a pretty great arrangement, it, given yeah, where you no, were at. It was yeah. great. And she had, <laughs> <laughs> she had like $10,000 a month, like guaranteed the first of the month, every month. And we'd just go get drugs and gamble. Sometimes she'd win a shit ton of money. Sometimes she'd lose it all in like a day or two. Right. But it was like, I didn't have to steal as much then. So it was like kind of nice. But then when she would run out, I'd have to go on missions. But I'd be driving a Range Rover <laughs> to go to these spots to steal shit. Wow. Yeah. Were you, during all this, were you kind of haunted by the idea of what could have been in terms of your bike riding career as well as just your life in general? Or are you so far gone in this environment that it's hard for you to even, you know, really think about what could have been? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, so times it would be like fantasizing about it, like what would have happened. And like, I, I knew at a certain point I was just like killing myself, but I just couldn't stop it. But I was like i started stealing bikes a lot like out of stores just riding them out and I bet every once in a while i'd get like a bmx bike for fun you can't get a lot of money off of that yeah, like a bike shop yeah just like well like a, like a bigger store okay. yeah like walmart a couple times and like dicks or sports chalet or you something. ride it out yeah, like out the just, fucking exit <laughs> yeah just and i'd also like strap a backpack full of electronics from there too wow. and like just ride out and i'd try and get like the most expensive mountain bike but like I would be able to get away from everybody because I still had like the BMX like mm. in my head and I could like bunny hop shit and just like hop over walls. I got away from cops a few times like that. Like then I started making it a point to get a BMX bike because I could like control it more and it was like my getaway the vehicle. That is pretty crazy when you really think about the fact that like BMX riders spend all these years and all this time learning to do all this really difficult stuff on bikes that is completely useless for anything besides looking cool or yeah. making something that looks tight. But then, you know, you think about it, if you were on your bike and you were being chased by the cops and there was a 20 stair rail in front of you, right. that t that rail all of a sudden a becomes the getaway. absolute fastest way <laughs> yeah. that you are going to like, if this was a movie, like you are out of there. Like they, yeah. they're not going to be able to get down those stairs anywhere near as fast yeah. as you just There's got down no the stairs. Way. And yeah. you don't have pegs, so it's kind of irrelevant for right. you, but, but I that sort it, of thing. You know? yeah. And yeah. It's still, and like I did do that. I had I would have like security bikes chasing me, cop bikes chasing me off of like UNLV campus. Mm. And I'd just be cutting corners, hopping walls, Right. cops come, ditch the bike, just walk away, go get a new bike. Did you ever make any serious effort to get clean during all this, or was there never um, even attempts, really? There was people trying to get me clean. Like, my parents would try every once in a while, and I just didn't want anything to do with it because I knew how hard it was going to be. Right. I did try, at one point, uh, Suboxin, which is like a uh, opioid withdrawal blocker. How was so, that? Uh, it worked the first time and it was like for a couple days and then I just got back on heroin because it was just like rough and then the second time I tried it if you take it too early before you're withdrawing you go into like crazier withdrawals really? and so I never touched it again after that because it, it fucked me up bad like for a whole day I was just like dying puking shitting everywhere wow yeah but yeah that was pretty much the only attempts I went to jail a few times uh, for like six months at a time and would get clean in jail, like cold turkey it out. You couldn't get shit in jail? No. Well, every once in a while you could, but like not really. Not like a consistent yeah. thing. You can't be like a real drug addict. Yeah. yeah. You can get shit in prison, but jail is like a little oh, okay, harder right, right. and le more rare and just more snitches and like just mm. stuff like that. But. Uh, but what would that be like getting clean for six months? Would you have? Would you be thinking like I'm gonna be good once I get out? Uh, two times I was just like, okay, I'm fucking gonna stay clean. Um, a few times I was like, cannot wait to get out to get high. Uh -huh. But like, and I'd instantly, you know, hook up and get something. But like, the two times where I did like like a three month stint. I came out and I was like, all right, cool, I'm good. And then like two days later, it was over. And I did a six month stint and was like healthy again and like came out and was like, all right, I'm good. I'll just do meth this time. <laughs> and instead of heroin. Instead of right. heroin. And then, but were you already then, on meth at that point? Yeah, I was already okay. on meth, but like doing both. And I was like, I'll just do meth this time and not get uh, physically addicted to anything. And then that just like quickly was like, oh, I'll take a hit of that. Right. You know, whatever. 
yeah what, what was the meth side of all that like it, it sounds like the heroin was like the real deadly addiction for you yeah. but then meth was like just this sort of thing you meth lighter was, on top yeah, of it i mean meth was just like always around like the people always had it no one cared to share it like they wouldn't care like, about sharing it like take a hit yeah whatever so you can just like get high all the time right heroin nobody wants to share it because it's like this is like my shit like this is like keeping me alive. Your for life force. Yeah, this is like, the only thing keeping me yeah, alive. I'm yeah, not, I'm not sharing this. Shit. Every once in a while, people would, but like, it was, it was like, yeah, you're not touching this. Wow. So like, the meth was just like everywhere. So like, if I didn't have it in the morning, and I'm like, fuck, I gotta go get some shit. I'd hit someone's meth and fucking be out the door. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So when when did you really hit rock bottom that made you decide that you needed to change? Like, how did this happen? Uh. Well, it was. My, well, it'd be like the last time I was in jail. It was like another six months stint. And 2013? Like, 2015. So? 15. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I'm fucked right now. Like, I had no like release date and I was just sitting there waiting for a court date. And, and this was another shoplifting arrest? Uh, this was like, yeah, I had like a credit card and I was getting gift cards at Walmart. Oh. And cops came in, I got paranoid and I ran. And then they fucking came and tackled me and uh, took me in. And I went in and I was just like, fuck, I, I'm so fucking tired of this shit. And this is like another time it's gonna suck where I'm underneath a bench and booking, fucking withdrawing. And then like they took me to, to the medical unit and saw a couple of my homies in there. They're like, oh man, I'm getting bailed out. I'm like, I'm, f I'm fucking staying this time. I don't fucking care. Like I'm not even trying to get bailed out or anything. I'm just chilling here. And you were over it at that was, point. Was, what, oh, you yeah, you, you just, thought that life on the outside was going to be that painful that you just yeah. didn't, weren't eager to I get back like, to it? Yeah, I was just like, what the fuck ever. I'm just going to chill and see what see how long I'm about to get, like, whatever happens, happens. And, like, four months into that, like, the court, uh, back and forth to court, uh, it was like stand up, sit down, arraignment, go back to jail, another month, go back. And they're like, okay, we decided we're going to give you three years in prison. I was like, fuck, <laughs> I was uh -huh. like, three years, fuck, dude. All right, well, can I get bailed out still? Or, because I was going to go on the run. And there was like, oh, yeah, no bail. Uh, this is it. So I was like, fuck, I went back to the cell. I was like, this sucks. Like, I'm fucked. And then, like, you know, a month, another month goes by, and I'm, like, waiting to go to prison, basically. And the phone rings, and they're like, it's the public defender asking for me and so i can get on the phone they're like oh we can actually give you drug court um it's like a counseling thing you have to like pay this certain amount of money you have to like do uas like urine analysis like every day for like a year you're on probation house arrest sober living all this shit and i was just like fuck that because i've heard drug court stories where it's like impossible right. to go through you and have to basically it's like being in prison because you have yeah, to be doing so many different things yeah, yeah. you basically set up to fail for most people because if you don't have a support system you're not going to get it also that. sounds crazy because like why would they be eager to put you into that position instead of just you, it yeah. just seems so unlikely that yeah. you would comply given how right. 14 arrests or whatever right yeah. and i'm just like also thinking fuck maybe i take it cut the house arrest bracelet and just go on the run and just get high and then go to prison <laughs> for three years you know? right. and uh i ended up like calling my mom and she was just like why don't you just try it just like give it a valiant effort and just try it i was just like because i was like already straight for like five months at that point i was just like okay i'll fucking try it then whatever like they're like we'll help you out and whatever get you on your feet and so i got out and uh started doing it and i was house arrested at an actual like a drug house like i had them hide all the drugs the cops went and inspected it and they let me stay there because i didn't really have anywhere to go like my parents were like helping me, but not like you can't. But that's you can't where you'd have here. to do so, the house inspection. So I, yeah, so I did the house inspection at this kind of like drug flop house. Uh, ended up getting there, and they're like, "Yeah, we'll we'll keep the drugs out of here." Blah blah blah. Like the next day, everyone's doing heroin around me. I'm just like sitting there watching, just like fuck. That sounds like it would be literally impossible. Yeah, it was. That, like you, you can't just like quit heroin and the next day you're watching somebody do heroin, right? Like, right. Yeah. No. It, was, it. I mean, I was just like, okay, well, I can't do it. And like a week goes by, I'm just like fucking over it. I'm like, fuck, this is so shitty. I'm, I'm cutting this fucking bracelet off my leg. And just like one of my homies walked in the door. He's like, and I told him that. I was like, I'm about to cut this shit. 
And he's like, do not fucking do that. He's like, you need, we need somebody in this fucking neighborhood to fucking show us that it's possible to get, get out of this shit. Because he had been through NA and AA a few times and just kept coming back. Right. And I was just, and that like gave me like this inspiration and spark and flame to like do it. And I was just like, okay. The next day, the, the probation officer comes over and there's just like eight people in there shooting up, like doing meth, doing all, like all the stolen shit in the house. And they take me back to jail. They're like, you knew the rules, like you can't be around drugs. I'm just like, well, this is all the only place I got. And so they took me back for three more weeks, put me back out on the street in, in a sober living house, which like added to my like pain. Cause I'm just like, fuck, I got to pay $600 a month extra now. And mm-hmm. like do house arrest and be compliant and then get like whatever job a fucking person with a felony has. But is the sober living house a better environment for getting clean than it, the actual active trap house? It, well, yeah, definitely better, but it also can be just as bad because all those dudes are also drug addicts that might just relapse or, you know, a few people did and they just get kicked out of the house, which was like the only good part. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, it was it was rough. And I did that for a couple months until like it's just like too much for me. And I ended up getting my dad owns a couple apartments in Vegas, so he let me stay in one while I got a job and uh I just started like uh, asking for bikes. I was like, I need a fucking bike, and got a bike, and started like riding on the weekends with like old friends that I used to ride with, and like that just started like becoming slowly my thing again of passion and love and like getting good feelings out of. And I'm just like, I need this shit, and so I just go out every fucking weekend. Really? And I was like 200 pounds, like when I went into jail, I was 130 pounds. And what are you now? Like 130, 140 I'm, or something? No, I'm like 165 oh, probably. Okay. Yeah. And so I put on like all this weight. and then 200. I'd love to see fat Ryan Mills. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Great. I, I got, don't know if I've ever seen those I photos. I got a photo. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. That's interesting that BMX like immediately sort of like, it, it left your life during the addiction and then it just, it was right there waiting yeah. for you once you uh, yeah. got over it. Yes. Yeah, it was crazy how it worked. And I, I fucking could not ride. At really? all. I couldn't air out it of, had a, all gone out away. of a quarter pipe. I was just like, the, fir- the first time I got a bike, I bunny hop 360 while I was like waiting to do a piss test and fucking ate shit in the parking lot and broke my hand. I was broke just like, it. yeah, broke my hand. I was just like, fuck. <laughs> like, this wow. is, but this time, my injuries, I, I don't take pain pills. I'm just like, all right, well, I'm just going to sit in pain. But like, you know, it's not bad. Right. So, it, you know, all this time I'm taking these pills thinking, uh, I'm, my excuse is, oh, I'm in pain. I'm in pain. My knee hurts. So I broke my wrist. I gotta have. Right. I gotta have. I gotta have it. Now it's like uh, you heal faster, and you fucking. It's not even bad pain after like a week. You, know? you heal faster if you don't take the painkillers. Yeah, killers? yeah. Oh, it really just kind of slows you down and slows the process. It takes your bone density away, like heroin and opiates. Makes it like so. Like my bone density is still probably pretty fucked up from all the damage I've done to it. So I, I break pretty easy, I think. Uh-huh. So I kind of like have to tone my bike riding down a little bit but still you know do what i can do what would you describe as the real like motivation that kept you from going back because yes you're getting into riding bikes again on the weekend and that's becoming very important to you and stuff but it just feels like with if you don't really have that much that's filling your days necessarily that's going to be really hard for you to stop yourself when you do have that that doubt when your brain starts telling you like no fuck it just do it right like you have to have something that's rooting you to reality to avoid that right yeah well the one of the biggest things was the three years of prison and Mm. and getting like a felony attached to my name one of the conditions was they're going to reduce the felony when i uh, finish drug court Mm. and i did all that and they so I don't have a felony. So, but that was like a major thing. Cause like when you have a felony, you're kind of fucked for a lot of shit. Right. So, but, and then just like my family being there and friends, seeing my nieces and nephews and stuff is like stuff I couldn't do. Right. Know, Cause they didn't want me around. Damn. So that, that like, were you sort of able to like open up and become a lot more of a person once you started to really like take a step away from the drugs? Because like something like that, like, not being able to see your nieces or your parents or whatever like a lot of people listening it's like almost probably hard for them to imagine choosing something over those sort of relationships but i mean right. once that drug is really taken over your life i mean a lot of stuff just goes to the wayside right yeah no it it the whole experience obviously changed me as, as a human being for sure i you know don't take advantage of days anymore i like became 
a lot more humbled than I was because of, you know I was just like oh I'm a fucking on top of the world like bike rider I can do whatever the fuck I want and it was like a big like smack me back down to earth like going through all this stuff but yeah just like uh, you're just grateful for each day that you wake up and have people to smile with and you know that's it when did you hit a point where you felt like I'm not tempted anymore. Like, I'm, there's no chance of me going back. And do you feel like that now? Or do you feel like yeah. if things were to really go badly in your life that you could see yourself going back? No, I'm, I'm at a point where that, that shit is never entering my life again. Um, I don't know the point of where I first thought that, though. It's, but, like, it's evolved into it now. And this is, I'm almost five years clean. Mm. So it's taken a while. But, like, I mean, I... It's it's tough. Like sometimes I'll like sit and think about it and fantasize about it, and but it's never to the point where I'm like I'm gonna go fucking get this shit. Right. But it's just like a quick thing. It's interesting the way you describe how much like riding bikes means to you now because I guess like you know you being my age and like us being out riding together and stuff and I just see like a level of energy in terms of your riding or a level of like really giving a fuck that. It is kind of something that I'm just not used to seeing from somebody who's been riding for so long. Like, you're used to seeing the 18-year-old kid who's pro and he's just killing himself and going crazy because he's you know, he's 18, doesn't know anything better. Is This is what he's good at. He's just going for it. But it's like a different type of energy once you hit, you know, 36, 37 years old because a lot of people, you know, you, you get to that point and, you know, it's just doing a bike trick doesn't seem like the most important thing in the world. Or like, never mind doing like your hardest bike trick that is going to, you know, put your life on the line or whatever. But with you, it's like you very much get that level of passion and dedication where it's like, no, this guy really cares about riding bikes enough that he's, you know, it means something more to you than it means to the average person. Right. Yeah. It's like a definitely a therapy session. Um, it, It helps to like push myself to a different level, like, or, you know, not every time I go ride, but like. Mm. I want to like keep improving and like see improvements and like that's why I got Instagram was like my my video journal like of like to see my progression like I wasn't like a I need to fucking get Instagram so I can get sponsors and shit like that it was just like I just want to see where I was and like have it there right but uh when I first started riding again or before I even started riding again in jail I, I like had like a list of goals and I was just like bike was like the fifth thing down like well, I could maybe get on a bike again you know whatever but it seemed impossible and I was just like the level of shit these days and I was just like why would I even try but get on a bike again like did you want to like just get to the point where you're able to like learn tricks again or just to have fun just, in your yeah, bike like what see, was it yeah just to see what I could still do and like but you know a lot of shit in my head i was just like back and forth like you're too old you're you can't do it uh it's like it's past you now like it's kind of pointless but it's like literally saving my life right so, yeah but yeah i mean i, I there's like other little goals too just like one of them was like oh, i want to try and get in a magazine again mm. and when i got out of jail magazines ended so <laughs> yeah right like, around that i was huh? like well fuck that but like so the, trying to do like the equivalent of that now like fuck out see if i can do a video part right i was we i mean you pulled me on to oss and mm-hmm. we're like let's do a video you know i'm just like okay because i was literally talking to kyle carlson uh like maybe a couple months before that i was like i want to do a video part let's film one like over the next year or whatever right so, like see what we can do and then like you're like oh you want to come on this trip i'm like Fuck yeah. Yeah, because you did say you were like, that's the most, or you said that was the first trip that you had been on riding wise, or it was the most yeah, you had pre- ridden for a long ass yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And it was like, I'd done a couple like Golden Day trips with Nate and just like, shout hello. Out Nate. Yeah, shout out Nate, big time. Uh, cause he, he pulled me back into the riding scene too, like a lot. Right. But uh, yeah, the, the OSS trip was like, well, also it was like right after I had COVID. And oh, yeah. so I was just like dying and riding every, we're like riding 10 hours a day. I right. was just like, I, I hadn't tested myself that many days of like riding in a row. Normally it's like two or three days and a day off or whatever. And we just went hard every day. And I was just like, okay, I'm kind of getting to the point where I think I might be dust. And then the last day all of a sudden came around and I was just like still riding. I was like, okay, 
I can handle that. That's cool. Yeah, that was a fucking crazy ass trip for me, honestly, too. Just being in the bike riding environment for that many days in a row because. At, at this point in my life it's like i'm used to like going out riding one day a week or you know here and there and having that full day of riding and that in its own is very exhausting and yeah. then to like do it for like seven days straight it was kind of like oh like i'm not so different than i was when i was 18 <laughs> where i could just do this every day yeah yeah, yeah. It, it was kind of eye-opening and pretty cool and then we went to denver and kind of did the same thing i was like okay i'm i'm hanging with the little the boys still. <laughs> like i can still hang a little bit yeah i mean my shit's not like the level i mean some of it is but most of it's not like i'm not like hucking myself and shit you mean but, crazy but do you yeah like hucking is a, a good way of putting it like yeah. do you sometimes think about doing the absolute craziest shit that you can imagine or are you more focused on like having a bit of longevity and not necessarily wanting to you know yeah i want be on crutches <laughs> for six months yeah or whatever. I, want it, I want it to last long some of it's like i don't sometimes i'm like i just want to make my heart beat really fast so mm. let's fucking do it but i think every spot that i go to i'm just always thinking like oh, i could probably do this but most of the time like the wiser me is like let's just hold back on this one then wait for a different spot like mm. let someone else get something here and we'll just move on and something will come around definitely but, yeah so how did you get working with the sober living stuff or uh, the rehab stuff that you work with now so crazy it's like so when i f when i first started writing again uh kyle with vital like did like a little piece on me like he's writing again type mm -hmm. of thing and I ended up getting this company, Fend, in Australia, hit me up. And they're like, hey, you want to advocate for us? So we're like, a opioid, against opioid thing. I was like, sure, whatever. And then they, uh, they sponsored the, the last Warp Tour and gave me tickets, like backstage passes to the Warp Tour and shit. So I went to the Warp Tour in Vegas and ended up meeting this girl that came to see what they were up to. And I was just like, hey, uh, I want to like try and get something in the realm of like counseling or help like, give back or whatever like see what i can do and she had seen the vital piece or something and i was like okay yeah i'll uh here's my card so i emailed her that night and i was like just let me know if you know there's anything that opens up and like a week later she's like yeah there's people are doing a documentary um about you know they're, they're into your story and there's a few other stories involved and so i just was like okay let's do that so did this documentary and people from the state saw it and in the documentary it says like Ryan want, is like seeking employment like trying to give back and like a week later I get an email from somebody from the state of Nevada it was like hey we we have a position for you so they basically like created a position for me to like kind of just have a job with them and it was like intense <laughs> that must feel like, crazy given that you were this like local menace for all these years that right. like for the cops like i can't even imagine what it'd be like to be a cop that's seen you a million times and then yeah. to realize that you're kind of on his side now yeah and what like one of the so I, I went to jail from that walmart getting cards but like i had a warrant still for an arrest because i stole a backpack from a casino and it was ended up being a politician from Nevada's backpack, and I had all his like laptops and iPads. And, and it shit. was just what sitting by some just, table was, or something. Yeah, he just... walked out of a cafe, and I he just left it there. So I just went up and grabbed it, and it had all, all this shit in it. I was like, oh, sick! Whoa. And they fucking tracked me down with like eight cops and a helicopter, and I tried running then, <sighs> and it was like just crazy. Whoa. But like the ironic part is, is like I stole a fucking Paul like government Nevada government official computer you're and thinking now, like and shit now, i got some laptops yeah and now <laughs> now they gave me a computer to do work so right. it's like a whole like weird full circle thing of that like, is crazy. It, it's, it's crazy but wow yeah so what kind of work do you actually do and what capacity are you dealing with people who have these issues um i mean we do a lot of like just like we work with partners and like fund different things like coalitions in vegas like needle exchanges and like mm. other kind of like uh uh, harm reduction type of things and also like right now like the the closest i'm going to be getting to like talking to actual addicts is we're doing like some survey interview stuff like trying to see where addicts are at what if it, what they know about like what we have for resources and like so i'm going to be like talking to actual people and getting information so that we can get it more widely known that that things have kind of been changing the stigmas like been changing of like a drug addict um it's like 
don't be embarrassed to like admit that you are one because you can get help if you do right. admit it. So it's kind of like that. That's interesting because that, that is one big shift that like we would like to see taking place in society where we are stopping treating people who are addicted to drugs like criminals and start treating them like people who are sick that need care and help, right? Yeah. Like, are you seeing like our government pick up on that attitude a bit? I mean, yeah, definitely. And them just having enough trust in me and giving me a computer after that charge right. is like it kind of speaks loud about like how they're like, okay, we'll give you a fucking chance. Yeah. So it's like, you know, they, they want to like help people get back into society because that just makes everything run better. You know, it's just, I don't know. It's hard to explain it, but it's like it's super important. Like, weird like under belly thing going on yeah yeah definitely um damn so okay like what what would be your advice to people watching this because i just like there's been so many stories like even in just the time we've been doing this podcast where we've just had different people who are on the show or in our vlogs or artists or whatever who passed from opiates or just drugs in general like very early on in their life like what would be your advice to a young person who you know is watching this and maybe like sees your side of the coin but then they also maybe don't think it's so bad or like what, what would be the general advice if you met some kid who you know thinks it's all good to pop zans and drink lean and do whatever like what, how, how would you communicate with them about that um i mean obviously i i would try and like just be like yeah that's not the business you know mm -hmm. that's not cool but like on a deeper thought i, I try and connect like to that person and have an actual conversation with them and like kind of tell them where I come from and where it goes and where it leads. I mean, like it's kind of typical, like I used to be a drug addict type of thing and you're going to fucking die. Mm. Like, I mean, could die or whatever, but it's, I mean, there's just a lot more out there right now that can like help you get away from it. If you are like struggling with it. I mean, obviously it's like the cool thing to do is like get fucked up and do whatever but it's a lot of people, it becomes a, a problem and that's like kind of in your DNA, like if it's gonna be, become a problem or not and you don't really know that until you're using. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know, if, you, if, it's, if it's a problem and like you need help, reach out, as soon, like the sooner the better. Like don't go fucking your whole entire life up and uh, just like lose everything. Yeah. But when you look at your whole process of addiction and stuff, like a couple of years into your addiction, do you think that there's anything that anybody could have done to have stopped you? Like somebody who would put together a really well-formed argument or like right. really convincing? Or do you think that you really like once you were in the shit, you were going to have to see that shit until you were done? Like, is it Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of like another thing I kind of leave a conversation with a person with is when you're ready, I'm here, you can hit me up and I can help you guide you in a direction you need to go mm -hmm. because I know that you aren't going to do anything until you want to do it until it's like such a problem. And a lot of people don't even get to see that point because they either pass away or they go to prison for some crazy sentence and don't get lucky like me and get a drug court offer, you know? So it's, uh, you, you definitely have to be ready yourself and uh, hopefully like shit like talking like this in front of people like kind of people can learn from it but I, don't know, I had to learn from myself so yeah I heard somebody say one time that like you know society gets the drugs that it deserves like pe people get the drugs like you know drugs become popular in cultures because there is something missing from that population and like when you talk about America and the opiate addiction I think a lot of it seems like the kind of drug that's like perfectly suited for people who you know a, a, a whole population who feel kind of useless feel like life itself like there's not a whole lot to to care about you know in a lot of ways in our society you know we've kind of like turned away from like you know relationships or, or mm -hmm. you know definitely turned away from you know the church and stuff like that like there's not a lot of institutions really like holding people together to yeah. give their life meaning and stuff and i say that as a lifelong atheist but like would you agree to that to some certain extent that like in a lot of ways opiates are kind of like the answer it's like to a, yeah, how it's, hopeless a lot of people yeah, feel it's an escape from that those thoughts and like yeah. 
it makes you like cope with like what you're dealing with and you're just like okay i can i can live with this whatever mm. i'm fucked up but it's not it's not just in those societies and those cultures it's it's literally everywhere mm. it's like you know i know i knew i sold drugs to lawyers i sold drugs to doctors i sold drugs to like everybody and was like you know it there wasn't it's obviously more in certain cultures but it's everywhere at the same time mm -hmm. so everyone you know the the addiction thing is just doesn't really care where you're born who you're brought up with it's just in there right when, when you think about or when you're like in that environment with like a bunch of bmx riders and you know obviously if you have a bunch of bmx riders they're probably drinking and smoking a lot of weed mm -hmm. i get the idea that that doesn't really bother you to be around at all no i mean people are going to be people and if you're fucking, you know, shooting up heroin in front of me, I'm not gonna be bothered by it. I'm gonna like try and help you, maybe. But like, I'm not. I'm not here to fucking judge anybody. Like, I've been through it. Like, I know everyone's just a person. And so, like, under all that masking of drugs and alcohol, and it's just, you know, I don't know. It's, I don't, I, I don't look at people differently, and I'm strong enough to like not be influenced by someone else doing something like that right so i'm rather been there no yeah i just think it's dope or i mean this is interesting because i feel like a lot of people have like a really hard time like people who quit drinking and they can never be at a house party where people are drinking like yeah. to some serious extent again that's just kind of interesting yeah. to me that you seem like you've gotten to the point where you have enough resolve that that doesn't really affect you right yeah well and i have i mean my little vices help like cigarettes and yeah. like those never went away no, that never went away unless i was like in jail and then i got out it was immediate but like you know people buy a a bottle of beer i'll go buy a bottle of coca-cola that's and what you do yeah so i just have like a coca-cola i'm drinking with you but i don't need to get i've been there i don't need to do all that i did the most in that area so it's like mm. i don't need to do that shit definitely yeah um where do you see your life going from here is it i, I very much get the feeling with you that you're just like thankful as fuck to even to even be here like i get that vibe when i'm out riding with you where it's like that a lot of people seem consumed with what they're trying to make out of their life and like you're somebody who when you're out riding it very much feels like ryan's a guy who's just thankful as fuck to even be here at all yeah i well because i am yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean my future i obviously want to like achieve more and do stuff but i've also been down to the very lowest part of life and so i came from like a middle class and fucked that all off um and so learning the being broke type of thing made me see like money isn't everything mm. obviously you need money to live but i'm comfortable even now where i'm at like if this is as far as i go like i'm comfortable but i have like ambitions to definitely keep moving up in the space i'm in and if i move up in bike riding so be it but i don't care mm. type of thing but i just want to go ride have you heard from a lot of people who are motivated or inspired by your story? Yeah, I, I think I, I pretty much get at least a DM like once a day from people. Wow. Yeah, just like oh, my family's been there and shouting out like me talking about it because I'm pretty vocal about it on Instagram and, and just life. I could think of people in the BMX world right now who are like, you know, very well-known pro riders that 10 years ago or whatever that we were looking at them like they were the shit. And then fast forward to now, I don't know what the fuck they're doing. I would assume it's not good. I can think of people who pop up asking people for bikes. Like mm -hmm. it, I have like a couple different BMX group chats, and like there's been people who would just pop up and or, and and you know ask three or four different people. We'd all get the same DM around the same time trying to get a bike. Yeah, and we would all know exactly what it's about is that they're the person's fucked up and they're trying to get a bike to be able to sell it or whatever. Yeah, um, that's crazy though to think that there's yeah. other people who. You know, you would be still, I guess, in those positions if you hadn't yeah. been able to make a break for There's it. There's a ton of people like that, especially in in the sport that we're in and like skating, extreme sports in general, sports in general, like just everything you can get injured in. Mm. The pain pill introduction is there, and that's such a consistent way that people get into it's it. So yeah, so many people's story, and it's uh, yeah, you're either an addict or you're not, like. So. I think like putting that idea into people's heads before they actually like, you know, I would want to tell my kid over and over throughout their life, pain pills 
Like you might at some point you might get, have to go to surgery. You might have to do it. But this is like the scariest thing in the world. Yeah. But a lot of people, if they don't know that, like like with, with your story, I mean, that's pretty terrifying that you were able to be on pain pills for years and years that nobody in any of these clinics or whatever really warned you about how bad it was yeah. and that you didn't have people like socially in your life telling you how bad it was. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable if you think about it by today's standards. Yeah, but back then that was that was it. Yeah. Today's standards is getting better. Doctors can't like over prescribe so much they can't do so many refills they can't do like mm. so many pills at once they're offering physical therapy other like acupuncture other like methods of like this is the only way mm. like surgery and pain pills like so it's getting better but i don't know like if i was offered back then like oh you can do physical therapy or do these possibly addictive drugs i would have done physical therapy Right. Like when I think about being young and getting surgery when I was, you know, maybe in high school or whatever, there's definitely times I look back on when I think about like the first times that they ever had me on Valium or, you know, giving me Norcos or Vicodins or whatever. And, it, you know, it felt really fucking good. But it also like I didn't socially have this idea in my head of like, oh, you could just like get more of these and keep doing this. Yeah. Like that just didn't really like, you know, it wasn't a thing to me in my mind. Like when I, I was thinking about the other day. I don't think I even knew what Coke was in like high school. Like, I don't think yeah. by the time I graduated high school that I could have explained to you what cocaine was, which yeah. is probably like a really good thing. I don't think like a lot of kids these days necessarily have that luxury. Yeah. I think that a lot of drugs are just so on front street in our yeah. culture and stuff that it's kind of harder for them to not know about it. But I mean, it's also, if you listen to rap music, you might get the idea that Zans and Parks are this like fun thing you can do yeah. and that's certainly yeah. not the case. I definitely get a little turned off by those type yeah. of songs. I'm just like eh. See but. we were blowing your mind on that trip because we were playing every rap song <laughs> under the sun and I could tell that certain songs you were just like holy fuck like this is crazy. Yeah. Yeah you definitely exposed me to some stuff. <laughs> I was like oh this is today's world. Right yeah. There. But yeah. yeah it is what it is yeah. I guess. It's a balancing act. Yeah. Fuck. Um all right, is there anything else we should talk about? Anything that you uh, want the world to know about this whole journey and everything? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. It's been a crazy ass journey, man. Yes, just to like it's see been a long one. I mean, just just being somebody who was like looking at you like you were the man in magazines and shit for so long, and then to be on trips with you and stuff and knowing that you've been through this fucking journey, I mean it's pretty astonishing to be totally honest. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just the fact that we're like the same age and that you've like had this big fucking chunk in the middle of your life in which you were just fighting this fucking demon. And then to come out on the other side and still be able to ride bikes really good. I mean, that's, pre <laughs> that's pretty shocking. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Definitely. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I appreciate you. No, to me. I appreciate it too. It's just, I, I felt like we had to have this, this uh, conversation because like, there's definitely been times where, you know, we've all just been like hanging out in the van and you just started telling us some story where I could tell that everybody in the van was kind of like just immediately jolted back to the reality of like, oh, right. Ryan yeah. used to be on the craziest shit ever. I think one thing that you said that made me uh, sort of shocked in that regard was when you said like you were talking about stealing and how the stealing addiction sort of almost took the, it, it held on to you longer than the drug addiction where you kept stealing for a little while after you yeah. stopped doing the drugs. Tell me about that. Yeah. That, well, yeah, that was kind of unexpected. I didn't, like, <laughs> I didn't know like it was like that, but like I was, I was like craving stealing still. Mm -hmm. I, I was in a sober living house, like, but I was broke still too. So I had that mentality of like, I, I can just get whatever I want if I just take it. Mm -hmm. So like I would go steal from the get food or whatever. Or, like, one day I was just like, took another dude and I'm like, let's go fucking steal something. Like, let's get a rush. And so we went and stole some shit. But and did it work? Yeah, it worked. And then afterwards, I was just like, I just risked three years of prison to fucking take some headphones. Right. Like, the fuck am I doing? <laughs> so it like, kind of was a wake up call real quick. But yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes I'll just like forget that like the shit that became normalcy to me is totally insane to other mm -hmm. people and i'll be just like saying shit and people are just like taken back like wait what i'm like oh that's not normal to say yeah 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 we <laughs> all we all forget that ryan has this yeah story well, cause, yeah because i'm kind of like back to normal yeah and i don't i'm not like a i'm not a person that wants to see harm done to anybody or like 
want anyone to be fucked over because I've seen it so much in my life. Like, I would never, like, steal from anybody I know. I never, I would never, like, want anyone to go through that shit. Right. So I just, like, I don't know, just trying to be normal. Do you human. ever feel like, do you feel like you still have to deal with the fact that people look at you, I guess, and judge you based on that stuff? Like, for, for me, it seems obvious to, you know, the way we regard you is, like, this is amazing. Like Ryan actually like had these hard times and beat it. And now he's, he's doing so well for himself. But is there an extent to which some people might still just look down upon you and not really care about the transformation and the growth? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, I mean, people aren't going to trust it always. Cause like people are just groomed to not trust drug addicts. Right. You know? And like, he's just going to turn Like I get that a lot. He's going to do drugs again, blah, blah, mm. blah. Like he'll, he'll go back. Uh, but like, yeah, in the beginning it was, it was tough, like getting trust back from people, but that was like an obvious thing that had to happen. Like maybe my own family, just like I'm out to prove for fucking years to, that I'm just not gonna do that, like anything like that again. But I mean, even there's just like yeah, there's there's definitely people that wouldn't trust me. I think, mm. but whatever. How how do your parents? How have they perceived all this? I'm sure they're overjoyed, right? Oh yeah, they are very overjoyed and they just uh it's it's pretty intense they 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 wrote me off for dead you know at one point and to like have me back and is like just great i put them through so much shit Oof, yeah. you know and like i'm sure just so many nights of just like where is he like mm. the times they felt safe they knew i was in jail they knew where i was they're just like okay I know, like for your parents, it's crazy to think that they probably at a certain point had to write you off just for their own yeah, they're, sanity. Yeah, they're, we're going to get a call one day that he's dead. You yeah. Know? And that was like a, I don't know, pretty shocking to hear when they told me that. I was just like, oh, fuck. Wow. Like, so I put you through some shit. Because you're putting everyone around you through shit. Like, you're not just putting yourself through it, you're like putting everybody. A lot of my friends would check the jail to see where if I was alive still. All right. Like, yeah. You know. Would you, uh, what would you advise to somebody who feels like they're in a position where they could use rehab or, or need to do something dramatic to get themselves off of uh, opiates or whatever? What, what would be your basic level of instructions that you could give them? Mm. Uh, well, dep I, it's kind of like a state to state thing. Like, so just look up, you know, whatever you can, like, for the most part, if you're addicted to drugs, most likely you don't have health insurance. Try and get on state Medicaid or whatever kind of thing you can get on. And that way you can go to these rehabs for free and just like go handle it and do whatever amount of time and not be like financially worried about where you're gonna be at. Mm. But there's also like tons of other shit. Like right now it's like difficult because the COVID, like there's no gathering. So like AA meetings are at the table. Mm. Um, a lot of rehabs are like, limiting people coming in but i mean it's still possible to do it but you know just it's a simple fucking internet search mm. to like get there so do you do meetings like AA type meetings um, you weren't like an alcohol I, guy right but you yeah I mean, AA or na meetings like narcotics oh, right, right. I, would, I would go because i was like mandated by court to go um but it just wasn't for me so much i didn't need that community of people and like don't know if I trust it so much, like, because you're kind of putting yourself in a position where you're going to make these friends that are going to uh, statistically fall off and go back out. Right. So, like, do you want to get invested in, like, a group of these people that are good right now, but you're going to likely see them die soon? Like, mm. so I, I went towards the BMX thing more. That's interesting. Yeah. Hobbies are extremely important, like, to keep your mind right right and to have a community of people of, that do your hobby like in any hobby you do there's going to be a community around it definitely no matter what so yeah well hey man it's a very very inspirational story and i'm thankful for you sharing with us and i feel like a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it i hope so i really appreciate you having me on here to talk about it because it's a it needs to be said i talk about it a lot and it's just like i don't know I feel like I get a lot of good feedback for the most part. So the more I talk about it, the better. Definitely. Well, hey, I appreciate your time, man. Yeah. Ryan Mills. Thanks, man. Thank you very much.
No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, subscribe. And uh, holler at Ryan on Instagram. He could use any positive comments, I'm assuming. He seems happy to deal with it. Yeah, hit me up. Hit him up. Appreciate y'all.